The Briss Sextant is a simple but ingenious navigational instrument invented by Swedish yachtsman and adventurer Sven Jervind, and he named it after his yacht, the Briss. It is a stack of three pieces of glass glued together with fixed angles between them. When a light is viewed through it, this arrangement gives multiple virtual images at different but fixed angles. It is used with bright heavenly bodies such as the sun and moon for navigation by observing them and timing the moment one of these reflections touches the horizon. The angle of that virtual image is known and therefore the elevation of the body is known. They have the advantage over ordinary sextants that there are no moving parts, so the angles can be precisely defined. They are used without a telescope, but the avoidance of errors related to movement of the instrument means that even without a telescope they can produce comparably accurate results. Disadvantages are that they cannot be used with dim bodies like stars, and that you have to wait for the moment when one of these images touches the horizon. You can't simply take a sighting at any time. Jervin's original is tiny, and measuring about 10 by 20 millimetres, it is easy and cheap to construct, so is suitable as a navigational backup instrument. But with a couple of modifications, it can be made more practical. This diagram shows a ray of light from a distant source striking a mirror at an angle A. We'll use the direction of the incident ray as our zero degrees for future angle references. The reflected ray leaves the mirror at the same angle A, so has been rotated by A plus 180 plus A degrees. If we now add a second mirror whose angle to the first mirror is x, we can work out the angle at which the first reflection strikes the second mirror, using the angles in a triangle formula of 180 minus a minus x. The first reflection has an angle to the incident ray of 180 plus 2a, and is turned by the second mirror by 180 plus 2 times 180 minus a minus x so leaves the mirror at an angle of 180 plus 2a plus 180 plus 360 minus 2a minus 2x. The 180s add to 360, so 0 degrees. And the a's cancel, so the ray leaves the two mirror system at an angle of minus 2x to the incident ray. That the a's cancel means that the total angle change is independent of the angle at which the light strikes the first mirror. If you have two glasses together at a fixed angle, they will always give this relationship between the incident and exiting ray, irrespective of where the incident ray is coming from, or the orientation of the mirror. And this is why the Briss sextant works. The sextant uses three pieces of glass, with different angles X and Y between each. This gives three beams leaving the sextant from one incident beam at three different angles of 2X, 2Y and 2X plus 2Y. Those beams are all the result of two reflections, and I'll call them the first order virtual images. There is another set of fainter images that results from four reflections. Counting these is a bit more complicated. Of the three first images, one comes from the middle glass and gives two second images. One from the middle and one from the front glass, as shown here. The other two come from the front glass and give three each, of which one each again is from the middle glass. To count images, we have to allow for this complication that some nth images have three n plus oneth images, and some have two. This table does that. The first column is the order of the virtual images, where the first row, order zero, is the real image of the sun. The first set of virtual images results from two reflections, the second from four, the third from six, and so on. The remaining six columns are used to calculate the number of images on the next line. Column 3 is the number of images on that line that have come from the front glass. Column 6 is the number that have come from the middle glass. Column 4 is simply twice column 3 and is the number of second order images from this path that come from the front glass. Column 5 is simply column 3, which is the number of such reflections coming from the middle glass. Comparable calculations are made for columns 7 and 8 and we repeat this process for subsequent lines to calculate how many virtual images there will be which are 3 for the first set, 8 for the second set, 21 for the third set, and so on. There is another complication, which is that many of these images will be copies by having the same angular deviation as other images. So, for example, this second-order virtual image has the same angle as this first-order image. 
and these are two pairs of second order images that have the same angles as each other, which means that you get five unique images in the second order, and when there are multiple paths to the same image, it will appear brighter. If the two angles x and y are not the same, one will be smaller, in which case twice the smaller one will be less than the sum of the two, and so the second order of images will contain one that has a smaller angle than the largest angle of the first order set. We can also make various other observations from this second set of virtual images that apply to all subsequent sets. Firstly, the highest angle deviation of any set of images is the order of that image times 2x plus 2y, and is 2x plus 2y larger than the largest one of the previous set. There will always be four unique images with a larger angle than the largest of the previous set, and there will be at least one with an angle that's smaller than the largest one from the previous sets. All the rest of the expanding number of virtual images are repeats of angles either within the same set or from previous sets. So what are these angles? They are all combinations of whole number multiples of the angles 2x and 2y. If you choose a ratio of x to y of 2 to 3, then they will all be equally spaced. If 2x is 2, the first set will be spaced 2, 3 and 5. The second set will be 4, 6, 7, 8 and 10, and so on. The tenth set will be 46, 47, 48 and 50. In reality, though, we generally won't be able to see anything beyond about the fourth set because subsequent sets become too dim. So now we can calculate the angles x and y to use. We're going to see between 20 and 25 visible images, and we want these spaced over the range of sun elevations that we are likely to observe. The maximum elevation that the sun can be between the tropics is 90 degrees. For northern latitudes, the highest sun we'll ever see is 90 plus 23 minus our latitude, so around me that's never higher than about 60 degrees. So for me, placing images at about 3 degree intervals is about right, and the intervals are determined by double the angles between the glasses. Therefore, using a ratio of 2 to 3, we would have 3 and 4.5 degree glass angles, giving a first set of virtual images of 6, 9 and 15 degrees below the sun. The proportion of light that plain glass reflects depends on the angle between its surface and the incident ray. When the incident ray is fairly close to 90 degrees to the surface, it reflects about 5%. That means that after two reflections, the intensity of the ray is 400 times less than it was from the original. And it's 160,000 times less for four reflections and so on. However, this proportion of the reflected light changes with the incident angle and with light polarisation, as shown here. When the angle is less than about 70 degrees, the light becomes increasingly polarised with more reflections, and the proportion of light reflected rather than transmitted through the glass increases rapidly with angles at under about 30 degrees. So the reflected proportion gets quite high when the angle between the incident ray and the glass is small, an effect that we will exploit. As sextants are usually used to look at the sun, you need a dark glass, and Yervin's design has it here on the outer side of the sextant. Unfortunately, that makes higher order reflections too dim to see, and with Yervin's original design, you only get about eight virtual images. I modify this, and I also change the design so that the top of the sextant is not blocked with strips of spacing glass to determine the angles, but rather it is left open like this. I move the dark glass to the observer side of the sextant and use it only to cover the top part of a larger 75mm long sextant. This photograph is taken through the sextant. You can see the dark area above where the glass is blocking out the direct rays of the sun, and you can also see three first-order images of the sun. The second-order images can't be seen, but I can bring them into view by rotating the top of the sextant away from me. This happens because the proportion of reflected light increases as the angle between the incident ray and the glass decreases. You can see that first-order reflections get dimmer because less light is being passed through the glass, while second-order reflections get brighter because more is being reflected lower down the sextant. 
This dimming of the transmitted ray means that there is a limit to how bright you can get the lower reflections to be because although the reflected proportion is increasing, the incident beam is more attenuated. To improve this, I remove the spacer from the top of the sextant so that the incident ray comes above the outer glass, hitting the first reflected glass directly, making more reflections come into view when the sextant is tilted with the top towards the sun. In the next video I will turn to the differences between using plain glass and partially reflective mirrors and to the process of making a brisk sextant.